Uh, welcome. My name is Alejandra, staff attorney at the Sustainable Economies Law Center. I am on Alone Chochenyo Muwekma land, also known as El Cerrito, California. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first gathering of Interdependence Month, where we'll ground ourselves in a practice of living and breathing interdependence. Um, your participation in this circle means a lot. What we'll experience today is unique to this space, and we thank you for your presence. So please take a moment to connect with your body. Feel your heartbeat and locate nature around you, whether it's a potted plant or a tree outside your window. I have some really nice trees here. So if I look in that direction, that's what I'm doing. Um, we have an ASL interpreter available. Their screen should be pinned, but if you're having trouble finding them, please let us know in the chat. Uh, please feel free to use the chat to share your name pronoun if you feel comfortable and where you're located. So this event is part of a month long series by the Radical Real Estate Law School, where we will examine our work through a lens of interdependence. Um, our Interdependence Month events will explore how we rebuild communities and legal systems on a foundation of interdependence. Next week, please join us for a series of short stories by people involved in highly collaborative housing projects, uh, sharing lesser known parts of the story. Uh, the following week, we will focus in on the US BIPOC led and justice oriented groups that are forming everywhere to steward land projects with the vision to permanently nurture livelihood, culture and community. And for our final presentation, uh, cartoonist attorney Janelle Orsi will share what we've observed and learned through our work and offer practical and, and engaging tools to support radical real estate groups. Um, so today we will be hearing stories, songs and prayers from some of the spiritual teachers and movement leaders that we've had the pleasure to work with at SELC. Uh, we wanted to create an experience that felt grounded in what's real, to balance the legal system's focus on mental concepts that run counter to our true nature and that don't align with our lived experience. Our speakers are um, Chief Kayleen Sisk, Tribal Chief of the Winnemumwintu Tribe, Michael Palm Preston of the Winnemumwintu Tribe, Nico Alexander from Shelterwood Collective, Inez Izquierda from Sugorate Land Trust, Adelaja Simon from Nafsi Yajami, and Dorian Payan from the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, so we'll be sharing this slideshow with participants so that you can take some time and read more about each speaker. So the US just celebrated Independence Day. In his speech delivered to 600 free white people the day after the 4th of July, Frederick Douglass declared, your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us, the rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. As we turn away from and continue to dismantle this legacy of, of violence and hypocrisy, what are we turning toward? So interdependence is a simple concept and can seem rather abstract. We're all connected, but what does it look like to live and breathe interdependence? Um, 
for me, uh, becoming a mom to a daughter has made me feel intense vulnerability. I look happy in this picture and I was, but I was also really, really scared. Um, part of me still wants to do everything that I can to protect myself from those feelings. The capitalist system encourages us to numb our feelings of vulnerability and push them down by accumulating more status and wealth. This toxic individualism actually impairs our ability to feel empathy for other living beings. Fortunately, a deeper, wiser part of me knows that I should listen to these feelings of vulnerability. They are a guide that reminds me that I am not alone. They remind me that I am worthy of love and belonging because we are, I am, and I have gifts to offer in community. This is interdependence. Um, so while I was pregnant, uh, swimming was a practice that helped to relieve my physical and emotional stress. It was grounding to take a momentary pause from the heaviness of my work, my mind, my physical body, and just be held by the water. This feeling of weightlessness helped me connect to spirit, to my inner body and to my baby. Those moments of feeling like everything was okay carried me through the challenges. It's helpful to remember that I can access that feeling at other times too. So um, the folks that we're hearing from today are all beautiful examples of what it means to live inter interdependence. I'm grateful for their example and I'm excited to hear from them. So I will now pass it off to Chief Colleen and to Pam. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, glad that everybody is on today and that uh, we can talk about this because uh, it really is the issue that has to grow and interdependence has to grow for life to be sustained. We cannot continue down this road um, that has prevailed as the life to capture, the life to, to want and need and, and get at whatever cost. We're at the tipping edge of that. And we know that because our state is drying up. The way that we treat our water is horrendous and it cannot continue to supply us in the need and the growth that we're going. When we're destroying the water system as we go, the system is drying up as, as you know that um, the wildfires are on a high. You know, we haven't heard from the volcanoes and earthquakes in a little bit, but I'm sure that they will be coming soon and will be uh, teaching, <laughs> teaching and trying to teach the people, you know, uh, about interdependence, you know, no matter how, uh, how bold and, and uh, in charge uh, the system seems to be, like right now I'm attending uh, fire briefing sessions for the salt fire and for the lava fire that are bur burning in my home uh, land and listening to them claim that they're getting the fire under control, that they're moving this, they're protecting this. And in reality, it's like the fire burned down to the lakeshore. Of course, it's gonna stop there because fire and water have an agreement. And then uh, the fires from years before have already burnt uh, the large canopy hot fire debris. And now uh, they, when they hit those fire scar areas, uh, they're not burning as hot because they already burnt there. But I, I look around the room and I think, you know, these people, they really think they're managing the forest. They're managing this forest fire. 
They have no idea any uh, prospect that the forest fires have to tell us an interdependence on that fire, uh, a fixing of a land that we have ruined by, you know, no regard for the forest, no regard for the trees, no, you know, the trees are families. We have no regard, we have no information that trees have families. You know, no, where do you, where do you learn that? You know, we don't know. So, you know, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And uh, with the tribe, the Winnem and Wintu people, we're trying to lay down this prayer, uh, the salmon, run for salmon, which is starting in a couple of days on Mount Shasta. And we're getting permissions to go through these areas of um, management systems right now for the fire to try and lay down these prayers. And so that's a struggle in itself to say, uh, we are interdependent. We need to lay down these prayers. Yes, we, we understand that, you know, you have to put the fire out and you have to save those houses and you have to, you know, manage those people who care about, you know, their wedding dress in their house that might burn. All of those issues. But at the same time, you know, what I would like to do here and maybe uh, Palm can help me and then I'm going to turn it over to him is that I want to uh, give this song out right now for the listeners and for the organizers and for SELC and the ones who are trying to help even with our community and the building of our uh, a housing, a sustainable housing uh, process, you know, gaining back control of our own traditional tribal lands for our ceremonies. And so I just wanna share this song that uh, basically says um, that the creator, the, the sacred is our teacher. And that we know this because the creator told us this. And because he told us this, it's gonna go on um, forever. It'll always be that way. Only we have to remember it. We have to recognize that, you know, uh, piles of money are not creators. They are not the ones who have the interdependence with the hummingbirds and the bees and the dragonflies and the, and the Chinook, the whales. You know, that, that's where we have to bring people back to. So I'm going to share this song and then I'm going to uh, turn it over to, to Palm to talk a little bit about also, <clears throat> so each a lot of skin, who went out a lot of him when you're Tina's team team. I'm just gonna uh, uh, tell the creator that we're we're gonna share this out uh, for all of all of the people who are listening because maybe they can think of something else to do in their own areas of their own loved ones and for their interdependent circles. And hopefully we can join all of those circles so that it gets bigger and bigger like it used to be. So all my own is Bayless Farm. So all my own is Bayless Farm. He had the hay when June told. Why can we leg a sneeze? So all my own is Bayless Farm. So all my own is Bayless Farm. He had for hay when June told, why can we leg a sneeze? So all my own is Bayless Bum, so all my own is Bayless Bum. He had for hay when June told, why can we leg a sneeze? Oh, thank you. And then I'll just pass it to um, Palm. I'll be at Palm Park, hold me when a man boss, that's a knee. Hey, Arctis, he shall the best in a little bit, he shall the best in Boyan Puru, he shall the best in he shall the best in Hi, my name is Michael Preston. I just wanted to thank you for allowing me to be in the space with y'all and for 
just being able to learn from everything, everybody here. I'm here to mostly to learn. I don't have much to say. I know that we have a lot of a lot of things happening in our homelands. A lot of things are feels to be like an emergency type situations. Even though, well, I don't know. I don't know if people really feel like it's an emergency type situations. We've been saying calling it emergency type situations for a long time now, long, long time now for Indigenous people. Um, actually. In my opinion, it's been from the 1870s. It's been an emergency type situation in California. Now it's a, it's just a continuation of that, and with these fires, is just an evolution of that emergency. And um, there's been about four different fires in our in our homelands, and uh, a lot of it has been burned up now. Maybe five fires, pretty big ones now, and like uh, I don't know, like it's it's a weird kind of truth to accept and and, and uh, kind of respond to like as far as housing situations are concerned as well I don't know if people really want to build like permanent housing structures around here um, and if they do like the alternative housing structures are in place like there's there's things that you can build that are more fire resistant than what they got going on right now and uh, the un lack of sustainable development that is happening I don't know. I'll just I'll just watching something in Japan about how they build everything about, or it's not everything anymore. But they used to build all their temples with without any nails or or bolts or or things like that. It's all wooden structures that are kind of uh, mended together with their, their 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 own. You know what I mean? Like uh, I don't know how to call. It, I don't know how to describe it really. But it's it's not really with anything. And they they said it's lasts a thousand years and like they're permanent structures. And like it just seems to me that there's like just a lack of permanence around here. Um, a lack of because they think everything's gonna fall down, or they think it's gonna like get burned down, or are they gonna resell it later on? That's gonna not built not to last, so they can resell it, and a uh, real estate industry or whatever you want to call it uh, keep going. And so. I don't know. I just want to. I just put some on mind because um, we're currently in the process of building something that has permanent, lasting um, effects for our people, but also for the land, for also for the the salmon, for the waters, for the fires. There's a prayer house that we want to build that lasts a really long time, and we don't want it to uh, be uh, be a subject to modern technologies in a, in a sense because the modern modern building codes don't operate with permanence in my opinion with that thousand year permanence that we want for this for this housing structure is probably it exists outside of the building codes and so we're not really able to build it according to shasta county standards and so we're kind of navigating this space at the moment trying to figure that part out and how to actually build this without nails and bolts and make it as traditional as possible um, and also with spiritual infusion inside of space and with that being the way we build space and that being normal and not being something that's out of the ordinary or radical but normalized into thinking that spiritual spaces exist and we should build more of them and that even if you don't think they exist spirit exists in space even if there's lack thereof spiritual essences in space that's something spiritual too when there's no spirit um it, and are void of it and we want to not go down that path anymore and working to build structures where we're at and fuse with with prayer and fuse with with happiness and with joy and with with a long-lasting um, effects that we you know and and confidence that we think that we know that's going to last and be around but it's weird though there's just like these these, these fire element um that we're at and we're in north california of course um fires are going on right now but that um i guess like what i'm trying to say is that uh, uh yeah i don't i don't there's a lot of lack of trust in in a lot of these places because of these fires and and i don't know where the energy is coming from as far as like the fires and how they start why they don't get contained and how they get stopped and there's just a big mystery in it all for me but there's there's still you know that's why we want to build these 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 structures so that we can say our prayers um for people 
say, have offered grounding spaces for people, offer chanting spaces for people, offer places where you can really, really heal. And, and how do you build such a space? And in my opinion, it's, it's with, it's, I like what the Japanese are doing and how they create space. So I'm trying to replicate some of those things, but yeah, that's, uh, I guess that's all I have to say for the time being. Just thank you for allowing me the space to say these things and uh, look forward to hearing from everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Palm. Um, thank you for being with us and sharing those words. Um, I'm going to invite now Inez to share. Thank you. <clears throat> What's up, everyone? So happy to be here. Um, my name is Inez Izquierda, and um, I'm coming to you from unceded Lashon Ohlone territory here, in, also known as Oakland, California. And um, this is, uh, uh, let's see, so I'm an artist organizer. I work for Sagorate Land Trust in Art, Media, and Administration. And um, I just wanted to come and share a little bit about Sagorate's work um, on behalf of our leaders, Karina Gould and Janelle LaRose. And one of the ways that I'm going to do that is just through sharing my story of how I came into this work. So I know you guys all know Sagorate and, and the work, and we're the first uh, urban indigenous women-led land trust in the country, and we're founded on um, protection of the sacred, sacred sites work. And um, some of you guys might know that in the 90s, um, the first law that that gave uh, Native Americans the right to their own um, ancestral remains passed. And that was around the time of the dot-com boom in the Bay Area. And so what that meant is as development and real estate was happening, um, they were pulling up the Ohlone ancestors. And that's when Karina and Janela started organizing to bring awareness to their existence to try and protect those sites. And that's organizing that's been going on for 25 years, uh, indigenous women-led land protection. That's the core of our work, right? Um, here in Oakland. And so uh, Karina, this is her ancestral land, but Janela, she's Shoshone Bannock. And um, she was really, uh, her experience speaks to the urban indigenous experience. You know, she had aunties that were relocated here in the fifties when uh, the government decided just to eliminate tribes, right? The Relocation Act and assimilation sent them to cities. So now LA and Oakland have the highest populations of intertribal native people in the country. Uh, so, you know, uh, me, I, I identify as Mestiza, mixed, Bolivian American. And um, uh, there's a lot of folks here in the territory that are indigenous folks of many experiences of the world displaced from their land. So I identify as a daughter of diaspora displaced from my ancestral land, displaced from a connection to my family and culture through uh, structural inequality, racism, homophobia. And so I, what I recognize is that my experience in these borderlands um, in between is, is also a bridge, right? And I'm, I'm really honored to, to be a part of that bridge. So I grew up part of my life in a mission in the Amazon jungle, a mission called America, Little America, America on the Maniki River. Um, I, Grandparents were missionaries that went to the Amazon jungle in the 50s. And they were the first contact with the Chimani tribe. Uh, their life's work was to uh, translate the Bible to this indigenous language, which meant making that a written language. And so um, I grew up part in this mission. We had church and sermon in our house every night. And the Chimani indigenous folks would come to get a bag of flour if they stayed till the end of the sermon. And um, we lived, I've lived out there for about five years, but that experience very much uh, informed my life, right? This neo-colonial kind of situation of this white encampment in the middle of the jungle and it, it, with an indigenous tribe. Can I share a screen? I was gonna show you guys a little picture. Oh no, okay, it's okay. Um, and so uh, what ended up happening is when, when Bolivia became indigenous led, um, they, uh, they, they removed all the missionaries and there was a huge amount of, um, you know, international, missions that send people all over the world. And Bolivia said, no, like we don't want any more missionaries. And so all the land that my grandparents, my white grandparents had stolen, um, ended up going back to the tribe uh, through a process of, of what Sogorte now calls rematriation, the return of it. And the house that my grandparents built on, my white grandparents built on stolen land uh, is now the house of the chief of the Chimani tribe. And so what I see is that in, in, in my, in this work, 
um, like an ancestral call to land return that we're here in this in this time, in this crisis, in this place, so that we can be the bridges, right? Like, so I think the interdependence in this, what it means to me is like something around a cycle, a cycle of healing and harm, how that's gonna come together. And, and returning the land is what begins to balance that in, in, in this work, in our work here. So Gorete, in this history that I've seen in Bolivia and the Amazon, and uh, try to reorientate ourselves towards reciprocity, reorient towards rematriation, um, and do the work that our, our ancestors are calling us to do, uh, all of us together. So let me just look at my notes and see if there's anything else I wanted to share here. Um, you know, please check out more about Sogorte, about um, Chief Kayleen's work, about the run for salmon and, and all, and how that connects with our work here in the Bay, with the rivers and the waterways and the fish and all the natural cycles. That's also our work to support. Um, and, and folks are gonna be coming down here and Sogorite and the local tribes are gonna be working in coalition with them. There's gonna be lots of opportunities for folks to, to plug in and kind of just start to, to reorientate towards them. Um, you know, the, the leadership of the folks whose land we're on. So thank you, Silk, so much for having us here. And um, I appreciate everyone looking forward to hear from folks. So, muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Inez. Thanks for sharing your story and your connection to the work. Um, I can pass it now to Nico. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you. Sal can thank everyone else for being here today. What a pleasure it is to share this circle with all of you. Um, yeah, so my name is Nicola Alexandre. I use he and they pronouns. Uh, like Ines, I'm calling in from occupied Wichon Ohlone territory, also known as Oakland. A uh, pleasure to share the space with you, Ines. Um, I'm representing, I guess, both myself and then my collective of uh, all queer, Black, and Indigenous folks who are working to return back to land. So we're called Shelterwood Collective. We are a I guess relatively new collective of folks working in Northern California to find land and to nurture community on land and to help reconnect black indigenous and queer folks to land as a source of power and a source of healing. And um, what I was invited to, uh, to speak about a little bit today is my own personal journey as a stolen person on stolen land, working to return to a, uh, I think a healthier um, relationship with the rest of nature, humans being one part of nature, we like to talk about the rest of nature <clears throat> um, as a method for earthly survival. And so I'll share a little bit about my personal journey and then how that weaves into the work that we do at uh, Shelterwood. Um, so I guess I'll start by sharing that I was raised, by, I, like to, I like to start by sharing that I was raised by the deserts of New Mexico and the alpine forests of Southern France. And I mean that in a very literal way, those landscapes helped shape me as a, as a young child. They were part of my kin, they were part of my family circle. Uh, I grew up as the only uh, openly queer person, the only black person outside of my family in the spaces that I inhabited. And so dealt with quite a lot of racism and homophobia as a young child. Um, and I found a lot of solace in the rest of nature, in those landscapes. They, they held me in very literal ways. And so from a very young age, I, I thought of the rest of nature as family, as kin, um, which is, uh, I think, a, a heuristic or a way of thinking that my ancestors used to have. But what uh, was stolen from, I think, a lot of, a lot of Black folks living in the United States <clears throat> is that perspective. And I learned that uh, when I went back to, to college, I tried to pursue ecology. I sort of tried to learn how to uh, return the kind of care that I was getting from the land to the land itself. Uh, obviously grew up in a time where uh, lots of headlines were about climate change and ecological collapse and um, the impacts of dams and all the issues that I think all of us here know and care about. I wanted to take those challenges on and I would look around me and my classes and realize that I was the only person of color in those spaces. Um, and for a long time wrestled with wondering what my place was as, a, as someone that yearned to be a land caretaker, uh, to return the gift of love that I'd gotten from the land. Um, and, you know, learned the impacts of white supremacy, learned the very intentional alienation of black and brown folks from the land as a tool of societal control by white supremacy, colonization, right? You can divorce people from the land, you can alienate them, you can take away that interdependence, you can take away the healthy food, clean air, clean water, and sense of community that allows people to find power and find community and, uh, and to build change. So I came back eventually to that work as my own kind of adventures and journeying around the, the calling that I was trying to hear um, came about. 
and really learned to, to see the land and see the species that made up the land as more than just an ecosystem, right? As a kid, I would, again, run the forest and the forest would heal and, and hold me. But as I learned the different names of the species, as I learned to sit in one spot and listen to the sound of the wind, listen to the sound of the wind in different kinds of trees, uh, really learned to start recognizing individuals. And for me, as someone, again, that's, that is a stolen person on stolen land, holding a lot of that alienation, learning to recognize the beings that were around me gave me a sense of community and helped build me back into a cycle of nature that feels, uh, that feels important. And so while navigating and holding lots of different forms of trauma, I think the ability to recognize who is with you, and I'm, when, I'm, when I say who, I mean not humans, I mean other species that make up the rest of nature, identifying them, seeing them, looking them in the eyes, feeling seen by them and vice versa really helps to bring back a sense of interdependency and remind you that family is more than just a, a human can that maybe you share a relationship with. Um, and I think that is, I think as an individual, I derived a lot of care and comfort from being able to see myself as interdependent with the rest of nature. And as we start to shift and think about the larger challenges that again, all of us are thinking about today, managing, stewarding lands in the face of ecological collapse, uh, working with fire to help to nurture more resilient landscapes. Um, the benefits of the importance of seeing the rest of nature as kin becomes all the more important. Right? You look at forests across Northern California, across the world really, uh, these are forests that evolved with people that were co-shaped by people for millennia. And the only reason that those forests were able to be shaped by, by people, by humans, is because of a really strong degree of intimacy that, uh, that the indigenous folks here, my ancestors back on the African continent, knew how to, to co-create co and co-shape, right? Being able to name the family members that are around you, being able to understand the life cycles and trajectories of the different plants and animals that are all interacting in a beautiful dance becomes a really important vehicle by which you use to shape and steward the land around you. And so early colonists, when they arrived uh, in California, would, you know, there are these stories of them thinking that the abundant nature, the biodiversity, the size of the trees were all gifts from the divine uh, because they couldn't conceptualize that people, indigenous groups could have shaped that land for 10,000 years, that they had a science that was so, so intimate and so well cultivated and so refined um, that they could actually shape entire ecosystems and bring out the best of what those ecosystems had to offer. And I think now we're suffering or dealing with the, uh, the consequences of that naivete and that arrogance and that racism uh, and that alienation, right? The belief that people couldn't do that helped to further create this divide between people and the rest of nature. <clears throat> and so what, what we're doing at Shelterwood is to really help uh, particularly black and brown folks, folks who have been told that they are not part of nature, that they do not have access to the outdoors, that they do not deserve clean air, clean water, clean food, uh, that they are in fact part of that ecosystem and that we have a role to play a role and a responsibility to play in helping to return to right relationship with the rest of, uh, of our ecosystems. So to give you one concrete example, I'm building on the, uh, the mentions of fire that were brought in earlier. Thank you folks. Is a uh, shelter is in the process of acquiring a piece of land that is fairly, uh, that has been cut multiple times over the decades, uh, pretty heavily damaged, degraded, unlistened to, unheld, pretty significant fire risk. And what we're attempting to do is bring people back into right relationship with that ecosystem to play the role that humans have to play in fixing our, our historical wrongs, right? And these ecosystems are incredibly fire prone because they haven't been cared for for 150 years. Um, we're seeing uh, changes in water quality and quantity because the land hasn't been cared for. And so a lot of what we do is, is think through how do we return to a holistic process of being in right relationship with the land in order for us as humans to survive, in order for the land to survive and thrive um, beyond what, uh, <laughs> what white colonists, what uh, an abstract alienated process would otherwise like us to, um, to believe. So I'd just like to end, uh, maybe Chris or Alejandro, if you could pull up that poem that I shared with y'all. Um, for me, this is one of my entry points into thinking through interdependence and in ways that cross not just ecological um, lines, but also racial lines and lines of activism um, and allyship to highlight how um, the work that we do in the, in the today has a very strong impact and ramifications on land and on the people that come after us, that we are not just in a moment of time here and now, but what we do again today will help shape and build the, the homes for, for generations to come. So I'm just gonna read through this um, Kind of lend my voice to the voices I've already shared, and hopefully this will be helpful and interesting for, for you folks. And this is 
a poem called A Small Needful Fact by Ross Gay. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which most likely, some of them in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Thank you for your time and for sharing the circle, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you, Nico, for sharing your story and your wisdom with us. Um, I am now um, very, very excited to uh, pass it to Adelaja. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra. I'm, I'm tagging in on, on that deep full breath that you just took you know, after receiving that poem and after receiving the voices of everyone who shared so far. Just feel really grateful to be able to add my voice in to this potent conversation to open our awareness on our interdependence in this living, breathing world that we're a part of. Um, Adelaja, go by he, him, as well as they, them. I'm here um, coming to you from unceded Lijan Ohlone land, also known as Oakland, right here, East Oakland, the Laurel District. And um, yeah, when, when I got this invitation to share today, um, just wanted to, what came first to me to share was just a, a story about my brother um, and a song. And so just the prayers that they, they both land in a deep way to help us move forward in a clear way together. Um, so this, this story is just um, how this particular song came. Um, my, I was in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I grew up. Um, my family, my mother was born in Haiti, also known as Haiti, and my father in Yoruba land, um, in a part of what's known as Nigeria currently. And <clears throat> in this particular moment when I was visiting there, I was praying in a really full and deep way for my family. Um, my older brother and my mother hadn't spoken in about eight years, and it had been since the remembrance, his remembrance of, of deep childhood, physical, emotional, and sexual trauma that he decided to, to make that wall and decided to pull away. Um, and he pulled away in the moment um, where he had shared with my mother what had happened. And she, you know, in the best that she could, you know, she said, hey, you know, I did the best that I could at that time. I did, I did my best, you know, um, kind of like in, in a way of, almost not really defending herself, but just some of that, like I did my best, you know, how, why can't you see that I did my best? Um, not having space in her own self to really just feel the impact of what her son had just been through. And he heard that, he heard her experience as not having space for him, which she didn't in that moment, she didn't. And all of that comes through, you know, he was born in IET um, and she had to leave there when she was 23, you know, in, in her mind, in that colonized mind, you know, moving towards progress too, and just trying to do her best to, to support, you know, her, her family and her community. It was like, I need to go to the US to make things better so that you can have a life. So she left him there, you know, for a year in IET. And when she was able to bring him to this land in New Jersey, she, you know, was learning English, you know, trying to go through school and just trying to make things work. And so left him in the hands of family, which she thought was safe. But that's where he received that trauma. And so I'm, I'm in, you know, flash forward, you know, I'm in Baltimore, just, just praying with all of my heart for that connection to happen in a good way. You know, my full but selfish prayer, you know, it's like my family, I want us to be together, to be connected, please, creator, like, please, I want my family to be together. And as I was praying, you know, sitting in my truck um, outside of the Home Depot, um, after I bought some, a few things to, to build some garden beds for my mom, um, I'm praying and got a really deep flashback of a moment in years before when I was in 
Santa Cruz um, at a meditation retreat at a place called the Land of the Medicine Buddha. And I was in a big field. And in that field, there were um, Tibetan prayer flags flying. And I remember the peace in my whole system, my whole being, just seeing those prayer flags and knowing that so many folks, you know, maybe these particular ones weren't handwritten, but so many folks had handwritten prayers that are flying in the wind. And those prayers are, are, are traveling even on the slightest breeze, you know, for, for our wellness, for our wholeness, for our balance in our lives. And in that moment, as I'm praying for my brother, remembered in an even fuller way that all of life has a prayer for all of us to be well, to be whole, to be balanced on, on the wind, on each little breeze, you know, blowing um, as each leaf flaps is a, a prayer, you know, coming from the DNA within that leaf, a prayer for us and for our wellness and for our lives. And in that moment, as I was praying for my brother in a bit of a frantic way, I was able to drop into that knowing that one, I'm a part of a larger system, I'm a part of a, a larger living body, and that that larger living body, all of us, you know, are, are coming together in a new way, in a in a clearer way, you know, as we open our minds and shift our consciousness towards balance and depth in this time. And so I'm, I'm offering this this prayer, you know, that this song that came through in that moment as I was praying for my brother, just 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 a, a little a little word on the breeze here um, for our wellness and for our balance. This is just to say this is a, um, a traditional Yoruba broom that's made with palm leaves. And so the leaves are here too. Leaves blowing in the breeze. Leaves blowing in the breeze. Breathing into me. Breathing these beings. Leaves blowing in the breeze. Leaves blowing in the breeze. Say a prayer for me. Say a prayer for we. 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 Where we source ourselves, where we source ourselves, where we source ourselves, where we source this realm. When we're gone, they will remain. Wind, rock, fire, and rain. They'll remain when we return. Wind will blow, oh, fire will burn. Like the opening of a door, may the balance be restored. Like the opening of a door, may the balance be restored. Be restored, be restored. 
be restored, be restored, be restored, be restored. May the balance be restored, be restored, be restored, be restored, be restored, be restored, be restored. May the balance be restored. Thank you so much. I um, thank you, Adelaja. Thanks, I, you know, for helping my tears come up. And um, yeah, um, I wonder if if we could, if you are able to, um, in gallery view, if folks that don't have their cameras on could turn them on if you feel up to it. So maybe we can just take a moment to see each other's faces. And just honoring everybody who showed up today and and realizing that um, if we had time to hear all your stories, they would each be deeply impactful and we would probably have so much in common uh, to share and, and so many differences to learn from. <sighs> and um, yeah, I, yeah, I guess I will now pass it on to Dorian, who I want to also mention has been um, really important uh, to me in my first several months at this organization to kind of journey and meet folks and um, just to be uh, somebody who I felt a connection to from the beginning. So I will now pass it on to Dorian. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I I feel both a tranquility and a racing heart right now. Um, the sort of momentum of our time, and also just really happy to be here with everyone. Um, I wanted to just share a couple of words in closing, um, just to sort of encapsulate. Um, you know, the theme of interdependence today, did a couple of illustrations just to sort of talk about it a bit. Um, oh, my computer's stuck. Um, uh oh. Just a second here. There we go. I think my computer's still. Um, okay, so when I think of uh, the impact that interdependence has had on me, I, I first think of, of how it, it presents itself in my day-to-day -day life, especially today. Interdependence is, is pervasive to me and pervasive to the people who surround me, and it operates as a, as a modality in my mind. Uh, I like to use the word modality because in its most technical sense, um, a modality is is the mood of a verb, and you know what are what are the verbs of our life if if not the actions that we take every day to sustain each other. Um, next slide, Chris, please. Thank you. Um, so I like to play with with words and and call you know interdependence rather than a modality a, a modality because when we color the actions of our lives. Uh, with interdependence, we find that even the most disparate and seemingly independent values that we uphold 
or that dominant culture has told us to uphold are actually very interdependent. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Things, for example, such as agency, mindfulness, and healing, often seen as independent values that we hold individually are actually very interdependent things if we color them in such way or if we allow ourselves to color them in such way. Next slide, please. Except, of course, in our dominant culture, we place those values on a hierarchy rather than in a web of interdependent values for us to live by. But in the words of the great writer Alexis Pauling Gums, I, I like to re be remembered that uh, freedom is available beyond the idea of an individual. The individual was not created for wellness, not created for my family to be happy. It was created so there could be a unit through which we could be extractable. So we could be understood as scarce when we're actually infinite. Next slide, please. So then a value like agency, rather than seeing it as atomized or as a way to atomize ourselves, which is really a crappy metaphor because an atom is composed of various interdependent pieces. Uh, next slide. Rather than seeing it as a value in a hierarchy, we place it in an interdependent web of autonomy, consent, and choice. Uh, next slide. Rather than seeing mindfulness as atomized for our personal well being, we see it enmeshed in the web with the potential to bring us a capacity for. Um, next slide, please. Accountability, the capacity to sit with our histories and the capacity to be present with others. Next slide. Healing, rather than a personal venture or a personal project or a financial burden. Uh, next slide is an opportunity to learn about ourselves when we tend to our wounds and, and create meaning with each other. Healing is cultural which is why we often speak as trauma, as a, of trauma as intergenerational. And it also shines best in, in the process of healing, understanding that throughout time, there's not only been intergenerational trauma, but also intergenerational strength that we carry. And how interdependent is that? Altogether, these values that might uphold the individual to do anything, but uphold the individual. Uh, next slide. And so this is part of our theory of change here at the Radical Realistic Law School. Liberation isn't making sure that we all have our own slice of, of personal freedoms or private property. Where real estate is private and antisocial, radical real estate is subversive and interdependent. We understand that this world and, and the landscapes that we create in this world are more continuous than we allow them to be. And also know that there are boundaries that do show up that we can always learn to honor better. I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to be here today. Um, and also to the folks who couldn't be here on the next slide. Um, you know, like Karina of Sagorate, Chris, who's here today, but is uh, in our role as, a, as our tech facilitator. Thank you so much. Pandora of Earthsea Farms and uh, Patricia St. Ange. Um, really grateful to be sharing this space with you all and inviting everyone to make this slideshow more collaborative. Um, we can go ahead and, and share it. Um, you know, any art, photo stories, prayers, or poems that represent your experience of interdependence, please go ahead and share them with either myself, Doreen at the south.org or Alejandra at the south.org and we can make sure to add them to this slideshow. Thank you, Dorian. Um, yeah, if, uh, Chris, you wanna keep scrolling through, we already have a few submissions. Thank you so much, Dorian. And I really loved your images that you created for your slideshow as well. Um, we have a video submission here from Lael from Shelterwood. And um, we keep, and this is um, Nico's beautiful poem that they shared. If we scroll, and of course, Janelle, our cartoonist attorney, with this, um, this uh, reflection from nature. Um, 
And yeah, with the couple of minutes that we have left, I want to just read this poem that Sue Bennett um, shared, who's one of another one of our beautiful co-workers. Um, so I will do that. Um, the moment. The moment when after many years of hard work and a long voyage, you stand in the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there and say, I own this. Is the same moment when the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. You were a visitor time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming, we never belong to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. And this is by Margaret Atwood. So, um, Thank you everybody for coming and please do send those offerings to the email and have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you.